to give you some context for this talk, um, this is uh, a summary of some of the latest research that I've come across relating to biogenic carbon accounting in whole building LCA. And this was prepared for the city of Vancouver. Uh, I was talking with Patrick uh, a couple months ago and um, you know they at the city, they, they really wanted to develop a better understanding on this topic, um, which is a very complex topic. There's a lot of confusion in this space. And um, you know, I think it's important to understand uh, what are the differences and how, for instance, different uh, LCA tools model biogenic carbon and what does the latest research say on this front? So um, this is kind of the culmination of this uh, small study that it did for the city of Vancouver, which is to try to compile the best available information that I've found on the topic. Um, I'll preface by saying I'm not an expert in <laughs> relating to force. Uh, so, you know, as I've tried to dig my head into it, it it's like a really complex topic. Um, and so I've kind of done the best job that I can to try to summarize what I've been able to under, uh, understand from it so far. Um, and hopefully it's valuable to all of you as well. And I'm definitely, uh, I definitely welcome any input from uh, all of you afterwards. Okay, so here's a quick outline of the presentation. First, I'll be talking a bit about um, why sorry, why biogenic carbon is important, what is it? Um, and also, uh, or then I'll move on to biogenic carbon accounting. And we'll look at how that's addressed in common LCA standards. We'll look at how it, it's addressed in across three main whole building LCA tools. So Athena, Tally, and one click LCA. Um, and We'll also look at the latest uh, industry average EPDs from the wood uh, industry and look at how biogenic carbon is addressed there. Then we'll uh, move on to uh, looking at um, what has been mostly uh, kind of a research effort at this point uh, or a research topic, uh, which is looking at dynamic modeling of biogenic carbon and in particular one methodology called GWP bio. So I'll share a bit about what GWP bio is, what it accounts for, uh, and then also um, introduced this new tool that was developed by Qantas and WWF, uh, which was just released, I think like, uh, or at least I only found out about it like a month ago. Um, so with this uh, tool, um, I ran a few scenarios. So these are kind of preliminary results. Um, and so I'll share some of the findings from that. And then I'll also uh, just speak a bit about um, the importance of forests uh, overall and how that also figures into some of our provincial greenhouse gas inventories. Uh, so you can get a sense of the scale of emissions that are at play. And then I'll summarize the key points and then we'll have some Q and A and discussion afterwards. Um, this, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted on our um, uh, CLF Vancouver YouTube channel uh, afterwards. Um, and uh, the slides will also be made available. Um, and this stuff will also be hosted, I think on the city of Vancouver uh, website somewhere at some point. All right, so first off, importance of biogenic carbon. Um, well, what is biogenic carbon? Um, it refers to the carbon that's derived from or contained in biomass. And biomass relates to um, material of biological origin, excluding material embedded in geological formations and materials uh, transformed to, fo to fossilized material. So when we're looking at um, Throughout all the life cycle stages, when we're looking at an LCA, so there's the module A, module B, module C, you can see these uh, green highlighted portions that shows you where biogenic carbon enters and leaves the system. So, you know, biogenic carbon enters the system in the form of carbon stored in the trees, uh, but it's also, and it's also um, included in the emissions from waste wood that is burned in manufacturing. Uh, biogenic carbon uh, is also stored in the product at end of life. So a portion of it stays in the landfill permanently. Some of it gets emitted. Uh, some of it may get incinerated as well. So we account for those flows as well. So there's uh, the flows that the kind of going into the system and out of the system. Now it's important to look at this uh, and look at wood products because we actually use a lot of wood in construction. Um, in residential construction in North America, uh, wood makes up the bulk of it. You know. Uh, I think this looks like it's uh, about, let's say, 80% of the materials used in residential construction that are, are uh, wood, or sorry, that, that are wood structures, sorry. Um, 
there's much less wood used in uh, non-residential buildings, um, but in residential buildings, it's definitely quite significant. That's the yellow portion, or sorry, the green portion. Um, if we look at global estimates for GHG emissions for uh, materials, uh, by one estimate from the UN um, Environment Emissions Gap Report, uh, it equated to about 0.9 gigatons of CO2 annually. So it's quite significant. It also makes up a, a big portion of our waste. Uh, so in the US, it's, uh, it accounts for about 22% of the construction and demolition debris for uh, um, uh, construction demolition waste in the US. Um, looking closer to home in Metro Vancouver, it accounts for about 60% of our construction and demolition waste. Uh, or 243,000 uh, tons of uh, waste. So it's important what we do with this uh, waste wood as well. Now, you may have heard that, um, you know, recently there's a lot more attention paid to embodied carbon. And one of the arguments for this is that there's, the there's a time value to this carbon. It, it matters when these emissions take place and uh, near-term emissions really matter. And so we should also really focus on uh, reducing these near-term emissions um, to reach our climate targets and also prevent, you know, climate tipping points. So that's definitely a, uh, an important argument because, you know, when we look at um, embodied carbon, when you construct a building, there's a big pulse of emissions, a big chunk of emissions up front. And there are some later on um, throughout different stages of the, uh, uh, throughout the use phase of, of the, of the building. And, um, and also a bit at end of life, but there's a lot up front. And so that's part of the reason why we want to really address the, these emissions because these are near term emissions. But similarly, we should think about it from uh, in terms of when are these emissions in sinks taking place with biogenic carbon. Um, sometimes we simplify these assumptions with uh, static approaches and we don't fully uh, recognize when these uh, emissions in sinks take place, but they also do have a similar time dynamic. And so um, I'll be digging a bit deeper into this later on, but um, a similar argument uh, can be used for why it's urgent to look at biogenic carbon and understand the time dynamics around it as well. If we look at the, the global CO2 emission um, targets that we're looking at, uh, to hit the 1.5 degree scenario target, we need to peak global emissions this year in 2020 and then in 2030, we need to half all of the global emissions, global CO2 emissions. And then by 2050, we need to get to zero and then go negative. And so obviously embodied carbon is a big portion, a big, big part of this picture, but also biogenic carbon is really important too. How are we gonna get negative? You know, there are some uh, uh, man-made kind of technologies like sucking carbon out of the air, direct um, uh, air capture, but also, you know, our forests suck in a lot of carbon, our natural landscapes suck in a lot of carbon. And so this is going to become a big part of our solution as well. So we need to understand this. Now with the city of Vancouver's climate emergency action plan, big move five, they outlined six big moves. Um, one of the big moves, number five, is focus on embodied carbon. And so the goal is to reduce uh, embodied carbon by 40% relative to by 2030 relative to a 2018 baseline. So this was you know, very ambitious, very uh, progressive of the city to, to account for embodied carbon emissions because this is typically not even in the scope of how the cities typically account for their emissions, which are scope one and scope two GHG emissions. Uh, you know, embodied carbon is scope three. But another really innovative thing that they did was they also looked at, for the big move number six, they looked at natural carbon sequestration. And I see biogenic carbon as something that can kind of bridge these two big moves as well. Because in big move number six, uh, you know, looking at natural carbon sequestration, one of the pathways for that is looking at land-based sequestration, which involves improving forest management and forest protection. And so you can see there's some um, uh, connection between these two topics uh, when it comes to biogenic carbon. Okay, so now let's look at biogenic carbon accounting. You may have seen a lot of whole building LCA case studies out there that compare uh, wood buildings to concrete buildings, for example. Um, 
and you may see different varying percentages of reduction uh, from the wood buildings compared to the concrete or steel buildings. And so this is a sampling of some uh, whole building LCA case studies, uh, which were um, included in uh, some research done by the Tallwood Design Institute um, CLT info sheets. Um, let's see. So there are varying uh, percentages reduction here, but there's also, um, it's important to look at in those results, do they account for negative uh, credit for storage? So did they give credit for negative, um, sorry, for the carbon stored in the wood, for example? And, you know, different LCA software tools have make different assumptions around this as well. Um, oh, actually, uh, if, sorry, I'm hearing some uh, minor noises here and there. So um, if, you, if you're not muted, can you please uh, mute? Actually, I guess I can mute all. Sorry, I'm just going to mute everyone else. Okay, perfect. Um, what was that I was going to say? Okay. So we should also look at with these studies, whether or not they account for negative credit for storage. Um, so for the amount of wood that's uh, stored in the building, do they assign some sort of negative credit or negative kind of emission on that side? Um, and so in this, it shows you a range of different um, LCA case studies from one to four story residential buildings to um, educational buildings, 18 story educational building or a residential building, um, five story office, et cetera. So this is part of the reason why it's important to, to look at um, addressing this because you can see there's big ranges in uh, these percentage reductions and sometimes they have different under, underlying assumptions. Now, before we dig deeper into the accounting aspect, uh, it's, it's important to look at these different life cycle stages and understand where, when these emissions take place. So when we're talking about life cycle assessment, LCA, um, these are the formal definitions for all of the, the different life cycle stages. So uh, module A is the product stage. So this is, it includes everything from raw, raw material extraction, or in this case with wood, like harvesting uh, of timber, transportation, um, manufacturing and processing, and then transportation to the construction site, and then uh, construction installation process. So this is, you know, everything before the building is occupied is module A. Module B is the use phase of the building. So if there's any, um, in particular, uh, you know, refurbishments or replacements, uh, certain components that don't last the full lifespan of the building, we account for replacements, for example, there. And then uh, module C is uh, at the end of life of the building. So all the emissions relating to deconstruction and demolition, transportation, waste processing, and disposal. Um, and then we also have module D, which looks at benefits and loads beyond the building life cycle. And it's kind of beyond the boundary of this specific building. So for example, if you wanna look at um, reuse scenarios or, or recycling, and you're trying to uh, account for the benefits, for example, of reusing that wood, and you know, in the next building, it uh, displaces a virgin wood that would have been going into the building. Well, that's kind of outside of the system boundary of the current building, right? And so uh, oftentimes you'll see results are reported in A to C, uh, and then they may also include A to D results. And so D is kind of supplementary uh, information that we typically report, but A to C is the main results that we are, are typically looking at. Now, one of the questions from the study is, um, you know, if we just look at the A to C results and we don't include biogenic carbon accounting, it seems like kind of a conservative assumption because we know that there is some benefit to the carbon stored in the buildings uh, if there's like wood products, um, but how do you account for that? So we'll, we'll dive deeper into this uh, soon. Now, if you kind of broadly classify different approaches for how you can account for biogenic carbon, there are static approaches and dynamic approaches. And most of the current standards use static approaches. Um, so in this paper, it looked, it kind of classified these four different scenarios. Um, the top one is this zero zero approach, meaning uh, we don't really account for uh, biogenic carbon. Um, so we don't look at biogenic carbon coming into the system or out of the system. We're just looking at mainly the fossil fuel emissions, for example. So, um, which is typically what you see in the LCA studies. Alternatively, there's also this minus one plus one approach where, uh, you know, in module A, you, um, the, the wood that enters into the system that's uh, assigned a negative, 
but then in module C, it's assigned a positive that because it's kind of just temporary stored emissions, but at some point it does, they assume that it goes back into the atmosphere, decomposes or whatnot. And so uh, that's uh, in this approach, it still balances out. So it net, still nets out to zero, but there's a, um, a dynamic involved with like a minus one and plus one. Alternatively, there are dynamic approaches. So um, Annie Lavassier uh, and colleagues are, um, have done this dynamic LCA approach, which um, models, I'm actually not as familiar with this method, but it uh, models um, some of the time variables relating to when these emissions and uh, sources and sinks take place um, over time. And then there's also uh, a dynamic approach that accounts for Wait, sorry, this is, oh, sorry. What this is, uh, uh, what this top diagram is illustrating is if you account for the forest growing before the, the trees are cut down and you're, you're including that time horizon. So before, so the sequestration takes place before you cut down the tree versus sequestration takes place after you cut down the tree and you're looking at you know, the new tree that's planted and grown. So sorry, th this is what the distinction between these two scenarios are. And in this bottom scenario, um, dynam dynamic LCA can account for this. Um, there's also a GWP bio approach, which I'll uh, talk more about later. So as I mentioned, uh, th this is a, a range of different standards, common standards and approaches. And you can see, you know, like ISO 21930 and a bunch of other ones they're all generally zero, zero or negative one plus one. So they're static approaches. And then at the bottom, uh, these are new approaches. These are the dynamic approaches. So as I mentioned, um, Annie Lavassier and um, some of the work done by Jeffrey Guess and Francesco Scherbini on um, GWP bio, those are dynamic approaches. And so within the dynamic LCA, as I mentioned earlier, there's a difference between if you account for this uh, uptake before construction or if it happens after the construction. So when does the sequestration in the forest take place? Are you looking at the tree that's replanted after the tree is cut down um, and you're looking at the sequestration from that side or you're looking at the tree previously and this accounting for the sequestration that already happened beforehand. Um, if you look at ISO 21930 standard for how they um, classify a sustainably managed forest, there are two main options. Either it's uh, a certified wood product or the forest overall at the national level is a uh, stable or increasing forest stocks, meaning it's like a net um, carbon sink or that it's stable. So those are kind of the two different approaches. So within the certified wood approach, you know, it includes uh, CSA, um, Forestry uh, Steward Council and um, Sustainable Forestry uh, Initiative. So FSC and SFI as well. So if it's certified, that's one way of classifying it. If it's also, if your your country, if the forests in your country are also stable or increasing in forest stocks, that's also another approach of accounting for it. And so uh, when it enters the system, it's a negative one. And when it leaves the system, it's a plus one, and then it balances out to be a zero. So if we look at Canada's uh, net GHG emissions relating to land use and land use change and forestry, you can see this top line number, it's all negatives. So that means our forests are a net carbon sink if you count for across all of these different factors. But an important note is that um, it actually doesn't account for natural disturbances. And you can see in these numbers, the natural disturbances, there's huge ranges. It fluctuates a lot year to year. Uh, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive. Um, lately, it's been more positive. Uh, so that's accounted for things like wildfires and insects. And so these emissions can be quite significant, but you know they're not considered anthropogenic in a way. Uh, so they're, they're natural disturbances. So that's why they don't uh, fall inside of our national inventory. But I think it is important to, to acknowledge that those, the scale of these emissions can be extremely significant. And, and I'll talk a bit more about this later. But uh, under this current definition, we are still a net carbon sink if you exclude the natural disturbances. So now we'll look a bit into whole building LCA tools um, and diving into the differences and assumptions and, you know, the modeling uh, within uh, three main tools, Athena, Tally, and one-click LCA. Uh, this is going back to that Tallwood uh, Design Institute's research where they looked at five uh, whole building LCA case studies 
And within all five of these different buildings, they use both Athena and Tally to model it. And so these were the results. Um, so before I talk dive deeper into these results, I should mention on a high level how Athena and Tally approaches this. So within Athena, there are two sets of results. Either you use the A to C results or A to D results. Um, in the A to C results, it does not include biogenic carbon. In the A to D results, it, it does include biogenic carbon, but it also includes all the modeling on, in module D. So as I mentioned before, if you're accounting for um, the effect of uh, re um, reuse or recycling or whatnot, those, those effects are also included. Uh, accounted for in module D, or if you're displacing, uh, let's say your incinerator would displaces fossil fuel production for elsewhere, that's also accounted in module D. So those are the two sets of results. Uh, A to C, you don't get biogenic carbon. A to D, you do. You, it, the module D is where the biogenic carbon accounting in, is comes into play. Then there's tally. Tally actually has four sets of results. So you can get A to C and A to D results without biogenic carbon accounting. And then you can get A to C and A to D with biogenic carbon. So uh, you can kind of toggle it on and off. And so that's why you see six sets of results for each building, right? A to C and A to D. And then uh, the green is Athena. The blue and the purple is uh, Tally, uh, including and excluding biogenic carbon for A to C and A to D. So if you look at these numbers, you can see these are in kilograms of CO2 per meter squared of floor area. You can see there's huge ranges in these numbers and it matters you know, which, uh, which set of results you're looking at, A to C versus A to D, if you're including biogenic carbon, if you're not, and also which software tool are you using. And so this gives you a sense of some, some of the discrepancies that you can see. And obviously if you're then comparing this to other buildings or sorry, other structural materials, you're gonna get different types of results depending on which set of assumptions you're looking at. So this is the kind of high level overview. Now let's dig a bit deeper into the assumptions. Um, I don't expect you to read this, but I will send the slides afterwards and you can read it. So this is kind of more of a detailed breakdown into what are the assumptions with Tally, how, how they account for end of life, and then also what are the assumptions with Athena in terms of uh, modeling biogenic carbon and how, how they model end of life. Um, I wanna highlight the end of life assumptions in particular which can be quite significant. So if you look at Athena, let's say you, you look at a CLT panel at the end of life, they're assuming that 10% of it gets recycled, 80% of it goes to landfill and 10% of it gets incinerated. And within the landfill, uh, this is where some of the complex modeling comes into play. You know, what percentage of this goes to an anaerobic landfill or aerobic landfill? Uh, what's the percentage of like um, decomposition? How much of it is captured? Like, do you have landfill gas capture? Those sorts of factors. So there's a bunch of complex assumptions here. Um, but what you can see is that uh, if you look at the original panel that comes into the end of life scenario, um, 69, uh, almost 70% of the original CLT panel is assumed to be permanently stored in the landfill. Uh, it's it's 87% of the portion that gets into the landfill. So 80%, 87% of the 80% gets you around 70%, right? So that's important because we're, we're, we're then accounting that almost 70% of the original CLT panels permanently stored in the landfill. If you look at tally, they have different assumptions. 14.5% uh, of it gets recycled, 63.5% gets landfilled, 22% incinerated. So less of it gets in, uh, landfilled, you know, 80 versus 63. Um, and then they also have different um, uh, decomposition assumptions as well. And so ultimately 31.75, so almost 32% of the original CLT panel gets permanently stored here. So you can see there's a big difference, right? Athena assumes a higher percentage, almost 70% versus 32%. So that will affect some of the results. Um, this just dives deeper into like Tally's biogenic carbon modeling. Um, and by the way, there's links at the bottom of all these slides. So for example, this was pulled from, uh, Tally did a great uh, webinar, uh, biogenic carbon 101 webinar back in 2018. So you can click on this link to learn more about it. Um, now, if we dive deeper into the end of life assumptions for Athena, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can see that diagram that I showed you earlier, that was a simplified representation, but this is a more detailed representation. 
So the, the product comes in end of life, 10% gets recycled, 10% gets incinerated through direct combustion, 80% gets landfill. So that was shown in the diagram, but this shows you a further breakdown. 10% uh, is anaerobic, or sorry, aerobic landfill. 90% is anaerobic landfill. Um, within that, four per, they're assuming 4% annual decay for 23% of the wood, um, the decay, um, Turns, 50, turns into 50% CO2, 50% methane, and of that methane, 10% gets oxidized back into CO2. Uh, then there's the landfill gas capture, 18% of the, it has landfill gas capture, 82%, sorry, 18% doesn't have landfill gas capture, 82% does, and of that, how much is how much of it is still fugitive gas emissions and how much of it is uh, the landfill combustion. So very complex set of uh, scenario assumptions, but. It's important to uh, just so you know what goes into this, uh, the modeling in the back end. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, biogenic carbon accounting in Athena is only reported in module D. And this is actually uh, further elaborated in their frequently asked questions on their website, uh, where they uh, justify like why they're or they explain why uh, they uh, model biogenic carbon in module D. Um, so you can look deeper into this, but basically it's a conservative assumption um, and, you know, it's reported as kind of additional information, but um, the, the current state of the art around biogenic carbon is evolving. And so, um, you know, they may adapt this in the future or change in the future, but this is kind of their uh, current explanation for this. Um, again, this goes back to some of the modeling from that Tallwood Design Institute um, study where they looked at one CLT panel and compared uh, the, 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 um, yeah, the modeling with biogenic carbon and without biogenic carbon for both Tally and Athena. Um, although I'm, I'm kind of uncertain in some of these results, so I'm not, maybe I shouldn't have shown this, but I, I feel like these numbers, I'm not sure if it was like mislabeled or whatnot, but I think these numbers don't fully make sense. Uh, at least the Athena numbers don't really make sense in my understanding because the, the, I, th I think the negative should come in when you include module D because that's when you're accounting for biogenic carbon uh, versus the other way around. So I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, they also did some modeling for uh, CLT versus concrete, but again, and again, there's, they're showing different sets of results here. So you can, uh, and not just looking at global warming potential, but also uh, some of the other environmental impact categories as well. Okay, so I, I spoke a lot about Athena and Tally. What about one-click LCA? So one-click LCA uh, shows biogenic carbon only as additional information. So in their normal calculation for GWP A to C results, uh, they're, they are looking, or that, that does not include biogenic carbon. But what they do do is um, they estimate the amount of carbon that's stored in the wood and they report that separately. Um, uh, and that this biogenic carbon storage number is, uh, estimated in two ways, or sorry, it's not necessarily estimated. It's either the value is provided in the EPD. So if it's explicitly stated in the EPD, they'll use that value. But if not, then they have an estimation for it. So they estimate the, the carbon content um, in the wood using this formula, uh, basically assuming that 50% of the wood, 50% uh, carbon content in the wood. And then they just report this number um, within each EPD. And so as an example, after doing a whole building LCA, this is just an example from one of my projects, um, you know, they'll report the global warming potential. This is the full results there, but then they also report biogenic carbon, but it's a separate, it's almost like reported as a separate impact category, um, even though it's not, it's just additional information. Okay, so that's a bit about how, how they model this. Now, now I should mention if, so they report it separately, but what do you do with that information? If, if um, you know, somebody may, potentially look at this result and say like, hey, if I wanna account for this, maybe they just multiply this by negative one. And so basically subtract this carbon storage from this number. And that may be an optimistic assumption as we'll dig a bit deeper into later, but you know, it's a, it, it's a, uh, it is a valid approach, but they're just recognize that there are differences in modeling because in this case, then they're not modeling the end of life. So unlike Athena or Tally, where they have a very detailed scenario of like, what percentage of it makes it into landfill and what percentage of it decomposes and how much of it actually stays permanently stored in there. If you just multiply this number by negative one, you're assuming all of it is 100% stored forever. And so that's, um, 
you know, that's a value judgment, but uh, yeah, that's just one thing to recognize about the differences between these results. Okay, how is it accounted for in the latest batch of the EPDs? Um, so if you look at the different uh, stages, you know, maybe about in a, in a meter cubed of wood, let's say about 750 kilograms of CO2 is stored in, in that wood. Uh, and then uh, what they've listed here is like ranges, low and high estimates um, based on differences in the tools uh, on each of the stages from the, the module A to the transportation. Actually, this is all module A. And then there's also some end of life. And you can see end of life, there can be big ranges in assumptions. And part of this is just accounting for, are you accounting for biogenic carbon or not, essentially. Um, this is a further breakdown. Uh, so if you want to dig deeper into module A, this is kind of what a flow diagram looks like in terms of how uh, one meter cubed of finished CLT comes out of the process. You know, coming into the process, there's 1.8 meter cubed of wood of raw log that goes in and how it kind of makes its way through. So you can kind of follow these green arrows to show to see where um, the wood makes its way through. And then at the end of life, as I mentioned earlier, there's there, there's different assumptions, right? Um, a certain percentage will likely go to landfill, a certain percentage gets incinerated in a power plant, a certain percentage gets recycled uh, or reused. Um, and that can be modeled in module C and D. So uh, this is the latest uh, EPD for uh, softwood lumber um, released this year. And what's interesting is now they explicitly separately report biogenic carbon and they uh, split it up into these categories, biogenic carbon remo removals from product, biogenic carbon emissions from product, uh, and then removals and emissions relating to packaging, which are quite small, um, and then any combustion related emissions. So the important numbers to look at here is um, for a meter cubed of wood, there's let's say 2000 meter, or sorry, 2000 kilograms of CO2 that enters into the system. So uh, think of this as like raw logs that come in, right? 2052 kilograms of CO2 going in. Then 1,025 kilograms of it goes out in co-products. So this it may be used for other uses aside from kind of long-lived wood products in, in the building. So like pulp and paper or, or um, others. And then uh, 185 kilograms of CO2 that's combusted at this stage. And then if you fast forward to the module C at the end of life, 843 kilograms of CO2 makes it all the way through. So this is um, kind of the final carbon content that makes it into end of life. Now, what set of assumptions you apply afterwards, whether you, you assume it all gets emitted into the atmosphere, so it's a positive number right now, versus like in brackets, this was the negative number. Um, you know, within the EPD, they're, they're required to balance this out. So it, it actually needs to net, net out to zero, but they're just explicitly staying all these flows, right? So this is a big pulse of negative at 2000. And then if you add up these numbers, it nets out to zero. But in whole building LCA tools like Athena or Tally, they might take this number and then say, okay, this we're gonna feed this into our end of life scenario modeling. What percentage of it goes to landfill? What percentage of it gets to incinerate it or whatever? And so then they model a, a series of assumptions through there. Um, so these are the same EPDs that I showed you earlier. Um, so this was the same table that I showed earlier. And then this is the, the regular LCA results, the GWP results that you're looking at. Um, and so, for the EPD, if let's say it's 63 kilograms of CO2 per meter cubed of softwood lumber, that's the main result that you're looking at in the EPD, right? But they're also reporting, for example, the biogenic carbon that makes it into end of life. So as I mentioned earlier, like in the EPD, they, they net out to zero. So you're not really worrying about the biogenic carbon, but for instance, in a whole building LCA tool, they may take that to, to model it in a different way or maybe multiply it by negative one or have some more complex modeling assumptions around um, end of life scenarios. Same thing with Blue Lamb, you can see the numbers here. So with all of that said, there are still a lot of knowledge gaps as it pertains to CLT and forest, right? Um, this is one of the most complex areas of modeling because if you think about it, uh, forests are really complex natural landscapes, right? There's big variances between different um, you know, ecoregions, different tree species, uh, different forest management practices. There's impacts to biodiversity. There's impacts to like soil carbon. So the um, there's a lot of mo complex modeling and assumptions and, and, and monitoring that needs to take place to account for all of that carbon. Um, and LCA isn't necessarily um, 
perfectly suited for capturing all of that complexity. And so th these are some of the things that have been highlighted uh, that are current knowledge gaps where there's current research or further research that's needed. Um, one of them that I want to dive into in particular is the timing of biogenic and fossil fuel CO2 emissions, mainly biogenic CO2 emissions. And so this uh, gets into those dynamic LCA modeling approaches that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's what we're going to dig into. So GWP bio. Um, one of the interesting things about this approach is, um, as I mentioned, this is mostly at the kind of at the research scale. So it's not like deployed in industry. It's not standard practice to use this in whole building LCAs, but this is kind of where the latest research is pointing to. Um, and th this is, uh, was originally developed by Jeffrey Guest and, and Francesco Cherubini, um, actually back at NTNU. So just as a side story, I, I used to study with Jeff and, and Francesco at NTNU, so, which is like a, uh, in Norway, it's a university. And um, within the industrial ecology program back then I was doing my master's and Jeff was doing his PhD. And so this was the PhD topic that, that he was focused on. Um, and uh, within this, what they're, what they're accounting for is for forests, we know that the forest rotation period matters. And we also know that how long you store that product matters. You know, the longer you store that product, like there's a difference between incinerating that wood right off the bat or storing it for, you know, many decades inside of a building and storing it, the longer you store it in a building from a carbon perspective, at least it's uh, advantageous. But how do you account for that? Because we, we don't really have a way of quantifying that uh, in our current static approaches. And so using GWP bio, uh, think of this as sort of a multiplier that's added on top of the biogenic carbon uh, figures that you see. So on this axis, you see rotation period. So everywhere from one year, one year would be like an annual crop or something that grows really quickly and every year um, versus uh, for example, 60 years or hundred years. So certain forests, certain trees, like it may take a hundred years to grow to, to maturity. So um, the, it's so this is accounting for the forest rotation period. And then you see the storage period. So how long is it stored uh, in, in either in buildings or in other products. Um, so uh, zero years all the way to a hundred years. And so for example, you can see, um, I mean, maybe this is a good representation of this GWP bio index. Um, typically when we're looking at fossil fuel emissions, we just multiply it by a positive one, or we're not really multiplying it, but it's, it's think of it as positive one, right? So that's kind of on the fossil fuel end of the spectrum. And then negative one would be kind of the most optimistic case for biogenic carbon that, you know, all the carbon that's stored in the wood, it's just sequestered and stored permanently and it doesn't impact the atmosphere. So what this is looking at, uh, the different colored lines show you uh, different rotation periods. So rotation period of one, you know, it starts off at zero. Uh, and as you get, store it longer and longer, like up to hundred years, it approaches uh, negative one. But if you have longer rotation periods, that curve shifts up. So the multiplier gets uh, more positive in a way. Uh, so you can see, for example, if we have a simplifying assumptions where, where we model things, we, we take the biogenic carbon number and we multiply it by negative one, that's kind of the best case scenario. But if we look at, for example, a forest that lasts for 40 or 50 years and it's stored for let's say 60 years, the negative number is not fully negative one, it's more like negative 0.3 or 0.5 or something to that effect, right? Uh, all the way to 0 0.8, negative 0 0.8. So th this is a way of accounting for, you know, the benefits of storing longer versus not, and also the length of forest rotation period. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are, there are kind of different approaches to dynamic, uh, dynamic modeling for LCA. Two of the main approaches is uh, the one developed by Annie Lavassier, dynamic LCA. And then there's GWP bio. Um, based on some of the research that I've read, GWP bio seems to be, at least from an LCA perspective, a more practical approach that could be easily applied on top of how we do LCAs um, because you're just multiplying it by that multiplier. And so it can be potentially easy. They're, they're dynamic characterization factors. So um, it can be relatively easier to apply given the complexity of all the products that go into our whole building LCAs. Um, so that, that's kind of at the research scale. So that's nice, but how do we actually apply this? Um, and 
you know, building on that research, which, um, you know, Jeff and Francesco were working, I think in like 2012, 2013, around that time range, you know, there's been further research that have kind of uh, been developed on this front. And um, just about a month ago, I found out about this, uh, this tool uh, developed by WWF and Qantas. And this tool looks at um, various different inputs. Uh, so it's an Excel spreadsheet calculator that you can download um, and it actually builds on some of the, those modeling assumptions and also adds additional um, uh, modeling on the forestry side of things. And so these are some of the inputs that you can look at. You can change, for example, the forest biomass source, so the climate and the species. You can look at uh, what type of material input you have. So like, um, are you using this for pellets, for wood chips, for, or sorry, what, what's going into the system, whether it's round wood or et cetera. And um, you could ex mention, for example, how long it's being used for. So this is the storage period, a lifespan for years, and then also end of life uh, modeling assumptions, like what percentage of it is incinerated, landfilled, recycled, et cetera. Um, and they model, uh, five forest carbon pools as well. So they look at um, above ground biomass, below ground biomass, um, natural dead organic ma material and soil organic carbon. Um, so these are, these are kind of illustrated by these different colors here. Uh, and the dotted line is the reference scenario. So the reference scenario, they actually have two different reference scenarios. One is uh, this net zero approach, which is kind of their default approach. So in this scenario, what they're modeling is that the forest is in a steady state, so there's no changes in the carbon pool, and that only physical carbon emissions due to harvesting and car carbon uptake during biomass regrowth are accounted for. So assuming that the forest is kind of already at steady state versus the foregone sequestration model uh, as a baseline, which is assuming that uh, forests are typically harvested at um, maximum mean annual increment and would continue to grow if it weren't harvested, but at lower rates. And so in the for foregone sequestration reference, um, the burden of avoided continuous accumulation of carbon is accounted for. So like if the forest were to keep growing and it wasn't in steady state, it was going to keep growing if you hadn't cut down the tree, uh, what's the foregone sequestration there? So that would change the factors somewhat as well. I should note that, um, you know, I, I, I did a preliminary presentation of this uh, research to a few different experts, including Jeff and, and a few others. and. Um, my understanding is that, you know, net zero is probably the one that's most aligned with the current GHG accounting standards and is probably the, the, the most appropriate, um, especially given that most of our LCAs focus on attributional LCAs versus consequential LCA. If you get, you look at foregone sequestration, you're getting into the consequential modeling domain. Um, for those of you that don't know what that means, which is, don't worry about it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the most of our LCAs, like how we're typically doing things are using the attributional approach. And so um, it may make more sense in the current framework to look at net zero reference. Uh, I mentioned that you can select different climate and species within this GWP bio pool, a uh, tool. And so uh, they have some uh, default selections here um, or pre sorry, predefined selections here. So I, I took this tool and ran through a few different scenarios. Um, and in particular, uh, in terms of the climate and species that I looked at, I selected these three. So in the cool temperate region, which if you look at their very grainy map, um, that's the, this green section, cool temperate, that's what I looked at in terms of the climate. And then the species that I looked at were spruce, pine, and Douglas fir, which make up, um, which are the kind of the dominant species that we use for Canadian softwood lumber, um, makes up the biggest percentage of our softwood lumber. So those are the, the species that were used in this modeling. Um, within this Excel spreadsheet tool, there is a kind of a simplified basic mode that's available where you don't uh, have to put in all these complex assumptions, but obviously it's more limited in its modeling. So um, this is just notifying you that you can use that approach. Um, but for this analysis, I used kind of the more advanced mode, which allows for more detailed uh, uh, changes in the in the inputs. So in the advanced mode, I these were I ran um, I think like ten scenarios here, looking at um, spruce, pine, and Douglas fir, and and changing those species changes the default rotation period. So spruce is seventy three years, 
Uh, Pine is 39 years, Douglas fir is 45 years. So the, that's the rotation period assumption that's changed there. And then I also played around with the lifespan. So for example, does it last 60 years, which is the, the typical lifespan that we use in whole building LCAs. Um, and then, but then I also modeled some some scenarios where let's say you use, uh, it goes for over a hundred years. Like let's say the wood gets reused. So how do we account for that? Um, or it's less, it's like 30 years. So I just wanted to see the impact of GWB bio on that factor. And then some of the end of life uh, modeling assumptions. Um, I mostly stuck with the ones similar to Athena where they had 10% incineration, 10% recycling and 80% landfill. Uh, I should note that their landfill modeling is probably nowhere near as complex as what Athena is doing. So there's probably some discrepancy there, but. Um, and then in terms of the reference, the, the baseline scenarios, I mostly use net zero reference scenarios, but I did also model some foregone sequestration scenarios as well. Uh, and this is more relevant for future research. If we have better data on the forest related aspects uh, and the forest carbon pools, you can input this. So you can, there's actually quite a bit that you can modify in this tool. So I think this is an area that we can look at in the future, you know, customizing things like carbon content, specific wood density, rotation period, growth function for the tree trunks, root to shoot ratio, soil carbon modeling. This is very complex and most of this is over my head too. But uh, th this is something that people in the forestry sector, they could kind of dig into deeper um, if they have better data on this front. And I know in Canada, we do have some complex modeling uh, of our forests that have higher resolution models of our, our forests and the, the, um, the various different carbon pools that are accounted for there. So I think that's something that could potentially be looked at in the future. So this is a summary of some of the scenarios that I ran. Um, and so, you know, there's a bunch of scenarios that are looking at building materials. So by building materials, I mean, it lasts for 60 years or hundred years uh, in terms of lifespan, mostly 60 years for these assumptions, um, or which is actually uh, spelled out here. I also looked at some uh, scenarios where we're looking at bioenergy. So where the lifespan is zero uh, or long lived paper products. Uh, oh, I forgot to change this, but this was actually four years. Um, this is a typo here. Um, and then I looked at the ranges in GWP bio uh, factors. So if you if you recall, like minus one is kind of like the really uh, op, is the op, the best case kind of optimistic scenario. And then plus one is like fossil fuels. Uh, zero is like no net effect. So you can see depending on these assumptions that you use for different species, different rotation periods, lifespans, you can see there's different varying degrees of like between uh, the um, yeah negative GWP bio factors. Um, if you then switch to foregone sequestration, uh, it can get into the positive domain. Domain, so it's actually a net emission instead of a net sequestration. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, maybe foregone sequestration is not the most appropriate modeling um, in this scenario. Um, and then the same factors show for bioenergy, but in particular with bioenergy. Uh, these numbers are in the positive domain. So if you think about it, a tree takes many years to grow. And if we cut it down and um, burn it right away, so there's no storage benefit on the use side of things, but it still takes an, another couple of decades for the tree to grow. Uh, the, in terms of the net carbon um, benefit, it, 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 it's likely actually a net carbon emission in, in that scenario. And so this can actually quantify some of those, those effects. Um, and then with long live paper products, you know, you're using it for four years, an optimistic scenario. Um, so uh, that that can decrease the sorry, yeah, make it a little bit more negative, um, but it can still be positive in certain scenarios as well. So uh, I'm not going to dive too deep into all this, all these scenario modeling assumptions, but I've kind of spelled out all, all uh, some of these scenarios that I ran and shown you kind of the diagram so you can see like what it looks like in terms of how it impacts the different forest carbon pools, what happens at end of life. So for example, if it, la this is a, I know you can't see this is probably too uh, small, but over a hundred year lifespan, for example, if you're looking at the end of life modeling and you assume 60 years, it's stored permanently or stored um, temporarily. And then you hit your end of life condition you know, a certain percentage of it gets uh, incinerated, a certain percentage of it gets recycled, a certain percentage um, gets into landfill, but the landfill has a certain decay function or whatever. So it slowly decreases over that. So you can see like different modeling of these end of life scenarios here. And you can see how, how they compare with the fossil fuel GWP impact. 
So the biogenic carbon side, that this is the green one, it's quite far negative for many of these numbers. Uh, and then this black bar is the positive emissions. So that's like the fossil fuel related emissions. But in some scenarios, for example, if you're looking at the foregone sequestration, the green bar can flip the opposite way. Instead of being a negative, it can go positive because the GWP biofactors go from negative to positive. So a positive 0.37, you can see it, it changes those dynamics. Um, same thing with bioenergy, uh, but in this case, most of them are actually in the positive domain for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, and then long-lived uh, wood products, sorry, uh, paper products. So as I mentioned, like in this scenario, we're lasting for four years and then there's the end of life scenario and it has its own set of decay assumptions. So then it, it, you can see how it changes uh, these scenarios here. Um, and so this is kind of a, a closer look at those different reference baselines. So in, in the net zero reference, as I mentioned earlier, we're assuming that it's kind of a net, um, uh, there's not major fluxes in the, it's already kind of in a stable state within the forest. So it's not like um, and still growing rapidly. And so that's the baseline scenario. And so that's why the GWP bio factor is more negative. But if you're looking at foregone sequestration, where, for example, you're assuming the tree was cut before it was actually um, at its maturity. So it's, it, it, if the tree were to keep growing and you're accounting for that additional carbon sequestration, um, that's where that scenario com comes into play, in which case it might bring it to the opposite end of the spectrum where it's positive, uh, positive 0.42. Um, same thing, um, net zero versus foregone sequestration, looking at the GWB bio for um, bioenergy, you know, it's, uh, it's still positive in this case, 0.23 with a net zero scenario, but in the foregone sequestration, it could go like really positive, like 1.31. So it can be quite significant on the other end too. And then same thing for the paper products. These are 0.08 to 1.0. So um, this is just like some brainstorming. <laughs> this is not a, a, how do I say it, like established, but what, this is a proposal that I was thinking about um, is can we apply these GWP biofactors to, for example, our EPDs and our whole building LCAs? So um, this is an example of the EPD. So this is the normal result that we're looking at where GWP uh, the, the GWP result that we look at in our EPDs. And that's a positive, you know, plus one, multiply it. Um, but then in the biogenic carbon portion, if you look at all these flows of biogenic carbon, for example, portion of that biogenic carbon goes into uh, paper products. So what if you multiply it by those respective GWP bio factors there? Uh, and then also a portion of it gets incinerated. So they have their own factors. And then at end of life, um, for the building materials, they also have their own factors. And if you kind of incorporate all of this, that could be some interesting research to look at how that would impact these results. Um, although, uh, given that I had given a preliminary presentation of this, uh, this presentation to some different experts in the industry, um, some of the feedback that I got was that likely at this stage, um, where EP, given that EPDs and whole building LCAs are uh, built off of um, LCA standards, and those standards uh, use the static approach, this would be a very big deviation from the accounting approach. And it would also have implications for how you model, for instance, for instance like other materials and whatnot. So likely at this stage, like it, it may not make sense to actually apply these types of factors because it's a very different approach to modeling um, and integrated directly into our standard EPDs or in, integrated into our whole building LCAs. However, I do think this would be interesting and useful, for example, just for uh, future research um, this could be something that could be uh, interesting to look at so that we can begin to look at some of these different scenarios because we know that there are impacts to these different um, assumptions, uh, which we can't fully articulate and quantify right now um, in, in our current approaches. Um, so these are some of the limit, even within GWP bio, given that it accounts for a lot of things, there are also still limitations, right? It, it, it's, um, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the dynamic carbon stock data in there. So they're using generic data, but maybe we have better data from our um, forest sector that we can input in there. Um, uh, forest practices, um, it doesn't fully capture all the forest management practices, such as like thinnings and fertilizer schemes and et cetera. Um, inclusion of other GHG emissions and other related metrics as well, and other climate change and sustainability metrics. So for example, this tool obviously doesn't account for things like biodiversity 
or water use or soil quality. So, you know, forests are a very complex thing. And LCA is not a panacea, right? Like it's a, it's a limited tool. It, it has its uses. It can inform certain decisions, but it wasn't designed to calculate, uh, you know, distill the full complexities of a force into one number and one carbon number at that, right? Um, so we, we, it's only one lens to look at forests, but there's many other lens that also need to be looked at, you know, from diver biodiversity, water use, et cetera. Um, but this GWP bio tool, I think, gets us a little further down the path to, um, you know, uh, understanding more things with this uh, uh, in terms of the carbon related aspects. Um, so now I'm going to move a bit into um, the importance of forests. This is basically just a bunch of other additional research that I've kind of come across uh, that I thought was interesting maybe doesn't directly connect with our LCA and um, carbon modeling, but um, they're relevant factors to keep in mind. So uh, forestry certifications, um, you know, forest certification standards account for a lot of things. You know, it does, uh, for example, address, um, I think it probably addresses things like biodiversity and uh, other factors that obviously can't be um, uh, addressed in LCA. And in that context, BC is a leader. Uh, we have some of the most for, uh, certified forests in the world. Uh, if you look, Canada is far and away the number one country uh, in terms of the amount of certified area. Russia is next. And if you split up Canada and you just look at the provinces, BC by itself would be uh, kind of the second highest uh, right, right after Russia, right? So we have a lot of certified forests. Um, and uh, there are different forest certification programs. Um, you may have heard of FSC certified wood, wood, which a lot of people think are perhaps more stringent. Um, you know, less than 3% of our forests are FSC. Uh, most of it is SFI or CSA uh, certified wood. Um, this is a report that was put out uh, a couple months ago um, looking at BC's old growth forests. Uh, so it's a strategic review, very comprehensive, has lots of recommendations. Uh, definitely not going to get into the specifics of that right now. But one of the things that I think is important is um, given, even though the LCA and, you know, even GWP bio, it's, it's a very limited lens on the force, but we know that forest emissions are really important and force management is really important um, for many environmental reasons, not just for carbon. Um, I think it's important to give confidence, uh, sorry, that at the policy level, we're looking at some of these other recommendations, these other factors. So, um, you know, within this uh, strategic review, there's a lot of recommendations relating to how we can better manage our force and in particular um, preserve some of our old growth force. Um, it's going to require a paradigm shift um, in, in how we approach uh, the forest sector. And um, uh, th this was some interesting points that I found because um, I was curious, like how much old growth forest is in BC? So if you look at the total land area of British Columbia, which is 95 million hectares, um, a, bunch, you know, a big chunk of it is not forest, obviously, but a lot of it is forest. And within that fraction of that forest, um, this dark green part, that is the old trees. So uh, that is about 23% uh, of the area. And if you split that uh, pie further, you can see what percentage of it is protected or in timber harvesting land base or non-timber harvesting land base, non-protected. So you can see kind of the relative split between these portions. This is protected, this is timber harvesting land base and uh, non-timber harvesting land base of the old old growth or old tree portion of it. Um, old growth forests have lots of different benefits. You know, it's, uh, it has impacts on biodiversity, impacts on different species, uh, um, resistance to fire. Um, so there's a bunch of reasons here that I thought was important to look at. And this is kind of a map that's looking at old growth versus um, other forests. I think it's also important to recognize that there's many different types of definitions for old growth. And when we say old growth, uh, people mean different things. And this report actually did a good job of kind of highlighting some of like the, the, the ranges and how we define tree, uh, forests to be old growth, but it's something worth considering. Um, this looks at a bit about BC's harvesting methods. So, uh, you know, previously it was mostly clear cut. Now we use clear cut with reserves. Um, dig us into the bit of the details here, but you can see how, how, how we harvest our forests. Um, and uh, this is different um, 
biogeoclimatic ecosystem classifications. So if you remember earlier in that uh, GWP bio tool, I showed you a very coarse map that had a climate and species, right? Um, but this is actually a, an even more detailed map of that, right? So the, uh, of different kind of climatic regions and also the, the dominant species in there. So um, if we have better data on that front, that this could also inform some future modeling if we were to want to do future research on this front. Um, there's also big impacts on biodiversity. So within that old growth strategic review report, um, it mentioned that uh, at various different thresholds, like if you, uh, um, how do I say it? If you retain more than 70% of the natural forests with old trees, it, it, it can be considered to be relatively lower uh, risk for um, biodiversity loss. But for example, if you retain less than 30%, the risk can be very high. And so this is kind of how they classified it. Um, and so you can see even in the current state, all the red regions, there's a lot of high biodiversity risk. And in the future, there's significant risks to pretty much all of our forests. So this is a very important factor that we really do need to look at and look at how we can address this. Um, there's also this logging scars report. This is not BC specific, but um, I think it's important to also think about what are the impacts, for instance, of our like logging roads and whether or not in those portions of our forest, do those portions of the forest grow back? Are we accounting for that? Um, are there ways of uh, reducing that? Um, in Ontario, with a selection of the, in this study, at least for the areas that they studied, uh, on average, it's about 14% of, of those forests didn't uh, grow back, I think, after a few decades. Um, and then I mentioned wildfires. So wildfires are a really significant factor, uh, but they're also very variable. And so you can see, you know, year to year from 1920 all the way to 2017, we have had big variances. And if you look at the average, I mean, it's kind of hard how does it it's hard to just dis distill any useful information in a way because they're so variable and especially lately with uh, you know increasing climate change our wildfire risks are changing um yeah so this is looking at 2017 and 2018 we had two of the largest wildfires so how does this look in the context of our bc ghg emission inventory this i know it's probably hard to read this but from 1990 to 2018 so these are uh, on the x-axis is the time or years you can see our GHG emissions hover between, I think it's like 55 megatons all the way to let's say 68 megatons, somewhere in that range, right? That's that's across all sectors in our economy, uh, about let's say 68 megatons of CO2 um, upon the most recent one. But then on the same scale, if you look at um, our forests, you know, between 1990 to nine to 2002, it was a net sequester. Um, you know the, the this is the zero axis so you can see the green is the the growth minus decay so if it's negative then you know we're we're growing a lot um but then if you look at the orange ones those are the wildfires so you can see the 2017 and 2018 wildfires were very significant those wildfires alone were two to three times higher than our entire province's emissions and so the scale of these emissions are really significant um uh, i made a different graphic of it so you can see how these emissions change over time so what I did was I actually highlighted some of the sectors. Um, these red sectors are kind of sectors that I think somewhat pertain to uh, uh, the building sector, whether it's like uh, operational uh, energy to electricity, to uh, heavy industry like cement production and you know aluminum smelting uh, and waste. You can see previously, you know, the, the, the force were sequestering a lot of carbon, but as we get into you know, 2012, 2013, these emissions uh, are growing. And especially in the last two years, you can see now the wildfires are significant. It's so much bigger than some of the scale of the emissions that we're paying a lot of attention to. And so, uh, and it's also important to recognize that these emissions are not included in our inventory because these are natural disturbances, right? Wildfires, et cetera. So we don't include this in our inventory, but they are extremely significant. Um, so if there's anything that we can do to potentially um, help reduce those emissions, uh, we, it deserves a lot more attention is all I'm saying. So, you know, if you look at 2000 versus 2018, you know, we can see that forests can be our biggest carbon sinks. They can be our, you know, big negative emissions. They can also be big sources. Um, so I think it's, it's paramount that we actually pay a lot more attention to our forest sector than we currently do. So here are the sum summary of the uh, key points. 
Relating to biogenic carbon accounting, the time value of carbon argument for addressing embodied carbon, why it's important to address you know, these upfront emissions, it also applies to biogenic carbon. So we need to think about the time aspect to biogenic carbon. Uh, when we're looking at whole building LCA results, I encourage you to look at what are the underlying assumptions there? So first, are they accounting for biogenic carbon? Um, are they accounting for uh, a negative credit for carbon storage? And if so, how are they modeling that? Is it just a minus one? Is it some more complex set of scenario assumptions for end of life like Athena or Intali? And also, do they include module D results? So those that that can help as well It's just when you're looking at these results, under, understand the underlying assumptions, um, which is actually the, yeah, the third point. Um, it's important to recognize the differences between the, those three different whole building LCA tools that are commonly used and what are the differences in assumptions there. And, um, and also that current LCA standards, you know, EPDs and whole building LCA tools, they all use a static approach to addressing biogenic carbon accounting. Now within this GWP bio, um, you know, this is more of a dynamic modeling approach and it accounts for force rotation period and product carbon storage. And I think this is important it's because, you know, this can give us some way of quantifying things in a way that we kind of already knew. Like we know that the longer you store carbon in, you know, long lived products that has a net benefit. Um, if we look at, um, aside from trees, we look at, you know, fast growing, um, you know, like uh, hemp or other residues or straw bale or whatever. We know that though that also has a good carbon benefit as well because of the short rotation period. But how do we distinguish that? How do we quantify that? I think GWP Bio at least provides one access to or one lens to understanding and figuring out how to quantify that. Um, uh, and the results can lie somewhere between the conservative assumption of like let's just not account for any storage benefit to the op uh, the optimistic assumption where we just multiply it by a negative one, but it may be too optimistic in certain scenarios. Um, and sometimes it can go beyond our con conservative assumption. It could actually be a net positive emission, like for instance, with bi uh, bioenergy. Um, this can be useful for informing policy and for future research. So I think this is primarily the, the domain that I, I see more of this work being done, but I don't think it's necessarily uh, appropriate to integrate it into our standard EPDs and our whole building LCAs at this point, because those all build on standards that are built off of static approaches. And so it wouldn't be necessarily compatible right now, but, but it is useful for research purposes. Um, and there are differences between looking at force at a stand level to the landscape level, looking at static versus dynamic approaches, attributional versus consequential LCA, which I didn't dig into as much, but um, yeah. Uh, and then fin some final thoughts. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, forests are extremely complicated and, you know, GWP bio is another model, LCA is another model, they're, they're all approximations of reality, but, you know, sometimes they can give us useful insights, sometimes they can't, but there's always exceptions to the rule, so I think it's important to recognize that, you know, none of these models are perfect, but some of them can yield some useful insights. Um, you know, I think LCA is really good for informing building level decisions, you know, for the typical architect or for the developer or, or um, you know, structural engineer, you know, it's, it's good for giving you um, uh, to, to inform some of your material decisions at that level. But it is only one lens. You know, when we're looking at more of the policy level that's informing you know, forest management, I think that's a, a very different scale. And so we need to look at, apply many different lenses on the forest uh, and at the landscape level that um, else, and LC is just only one lens in that. So um, yeah. And the other point is that, you know, you may look at this and you may say, oh, well, like these results are all over the map. We have such big variances in the results in whole building LCs between different tools and the underlying data. I would say, don't wait for the, this to get perfect. Don't, don't wait for perfect LCA data and tools. Um, it's not perfect, but at the same time, I think the cost of inaction is far higher. Uh, you know, all of this research has been around for decades, right? Like LCA has been around for decades. But nobody really paid attention until now. I would say in the past year or two, that's when attention in the industry has skyrocketed because we actually have policy coming into play and, and we have investments coming into this area. And so now we have a lot of efforts to improve the LCA data and improve the tools. So all of these things need to move in parallel, right? Architects and engineers, we need to develop a better understanding of embodied carbon. Policymakers need to set the bar high. The software providers, the data, the data needs to improve. All things need to move in parallel, but we can't wait for you know everything to be perfect on the analysis side 
uh, before we move because um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, I just don't think that's that's where to look. The other thing is uh, blind spots. This is kind of being an, an underlying um, approach of mine is that really try to find where the blind spots are. You know, embodied carbon itself is a blind spot, but within that field, there's many blind spots like refrigerants, like uh, the forestry related aspects and dryogenic carbon accounting. And each time we find these, we may sometimes get discouraged. We're like, oh, wow, there's so much that we don't know. But I actually think there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of mitigation opportunity when we discover these areas. So we should really be on a hunt for these blind spots because they actually have big mitigation opportunities for reducing emissions. Um, and I think embodied carbon is sort of a pathway to asking deeper questions about our supply chains, about, uh, you know, every time we make decisions, we set forth a whole complex series of things that happen in the supply chain globally, you know, mines around halfway around the world or forests. We have we, we have big impacts with our decisions. And so this is one lens, you know, we're looking at the carbon aspect, but it's starting to get us to ask deeper questions, for example, about our forests and what are the scale of emissions there and what can we do on that front? And so I, I feel like it's a pathway to asking deeper questions about, you know, the materials we use and, and how we build. Um, and finally, you know, sustainable forestry and biogenic carbon, it's a very complex topic, but I think it's worth uh, developing a deeper understanding of, especially given how significant the emissions can be, both on the sink side and also on the source side. So, uh, oh, and this was, this was actually just a book recommendation. <laughs> this is a little bit out from left field, but I think this book has actually challenged my thinking a lot on uh, not just forest, but also just on climate change and how to tackle it. So if you're interested, check out the book um, and also uh, some of the, some videos that are interesting as well. Um, okay, let's get into Q&A and discussion. Sorry, that probably went a bit longer than I expected, but we still have 15 minutes and I'm uh, also available to stick in longer afterwards. But uh, with that, I'm going to open it up. Oh, sorry. I'm going to open it up for q a and i'll just stop sharing so we can actually see each other and if you um uh are up for it please turn on your camera so that we can actually have a conversation so um any questions or comments uh and you may have to oh wait actually i just realized there's a bunch of chats sorry uh i haven't even i've not paid attention to this at all let me just Pop this out. Any questions? Actually, I'm wondering if people can unmute themselves or did I, maybe I need to cancel that or can people, actually, Patrick, can you unmute yourself right now? I can, yeah. Okay, so, it's working. Okay, yeah, sorry. I wasn't sure if I needed to do that. Okay. I'll, I'll just briefly say, and I've seen others say similar, like, thank, I really, really appreciate this. It's an incredible amount of information distilled in a very understandable way. It feels like I feel like I'm watching like a masterclass right now on um, a lot of very important things. So thanks again for this. This is outstanding. No problem. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to work on this project. Um, all right. Anyone else? Uh, otherwise, I guess I can look in the Q&A as well. But if anybody. Yeah, uh, Anthony, I have a question. That was great. Thank you. Wondering if we know yet or if how this might be approached at a national level. Um, is there any is there a has there been discussions about how to treat biogenic carbon from the NRC at the national level, for example? There was, I mean, um, so for those of you not familiar, the National Research Council has an initiative called uh, LCA Square. Why, what was it? Uh, I, I forget the back, I'm sorry. Low carbon assets through yeah. LCA. Low carbon assets through life cycle assessment. So there, there's a big technical committee there. And uh, earlier last year, um, there was one call that was focused on biogenic carbon. And in particular, uh, there was presentations on, um, I forgot the, the acronym for this model, but like CBM or CF, something to that effect. But it's a model of uh, the a carbon modeling of all of our force with a um, very high level of resolution on our force. And so uh, there was a presentation on like the data that's available there and whether or not we could actually integrate that into um, LCA or where there's potential overlap there. But that was kind of just a starting discussion. I haven't kind of heard anything since, but I do think NRC is in a well positioned to um, uh, definitely fund research and, and kind of dive deeper on this topic. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Um. Sorry, it looks like your your audio is not coming through. Yeah, Anthony, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah sorry, my my video is my my camera is not working right now. Okay. Um, so is there is there any? I mean, this might be a next step, but is there a way to integrate financial benefits to these kinds of models? Um, you know, money savings. Potentially, uh, I haven't given much thought to this, uh, but I, uh, I think there's potential. I mean, on the carbon side of things, uh, like you could imagine um, assigning some carbon value to the, the carbon sequestration benefits and, and whatnot. Um, I know actually uh, there's, a, there's a company called Aureus Earth by Will Shrubar that just recently started up. And so they're looking at um, how, to, how to address, um, uh, how to kind of create a carbon market for, for these embodied emissions and in particular for sequestration. So there are some efforts on that front. Um, yeah, so I think there, 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 there's, that is a possibility. Okay, well, and I just wanna also thank you for this presentation. This was awesome. No problem. This was really, yeah. Thank, thanks, thanks for joining. Anyone else? And yeah, it's Adam Auer here, Sven Association. Um, this is a really great presentation, thank you. Um, one of the one of the things that I've kind of uh, learned a little bit about uh, having participated in some of the carbon leadership forum series on embodied carbon uh, from wood products is that there is a really big difference between just sort of the forest industry across different jurisdictions. So, for example, in Canada, most of our forestry happens in intact forest on crown land, whereas you know in the U.S. and in many places in Europe, we're talking about forests that have been logged for for much longer periods or are wouldn't wouldn't be considered intact forests anymore and that this potentially has a pretty significant impact on the biogenic carbon story because in some jurisdictions there's no bi biogenic carbon loss from converting an intact forest into a secondary managed forest which has an overall storage capacity less than uh, an intact so I'm just wondering like in your research do you see have you seen any you know, any discussion of that, any discussion of, of um, you know, the impact of forest conversion when you're taking like an existing healthy carbon pool and moving to a managed forest, you know, the, the, the sort of net permanent loss of carbon and how that might or might not be accounted for in LCA? Um, I haven't seen it. I mean, I, I've heard the point discussed. I, I don't know that I've seen any like quantification of like how, how you would address that, but I don't know if there's others on this call. I mean, there's many experts on this call or like Peter or anyone else. I don't know if you guys have any input on this. Yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, Peter might actually have an answer to this question about whether or not in, within the forest industry in order to kind of find those idealized scenarios for biogenic carbon from wood products, is there some thinking going on about, you know, retreating from intact and moving more to a model similar to the US and other jurisdictions where you're, you're only harvesting in, in already managed forests? I mean, from my understanding, at least just on the BC side, I think a lot of our forests are primary forests, so we just don't have as much secondary forests. So I think, at least that's my very basic understanding. But I don't know, Peter, if there's anything that you want to speak on that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anthony and Adam. I think thanks for the question. Um, the uh, uh, there's a lot of second growth forests in British Columbia which are uh, coming online. But the, it, the history goes actually back to the 50s when the province, be, before a lot of the considerations around environment and biodiversity and carbon and all that, the intent was to convert a portion, roughly a quarter of the, of the province. Uh, so about a third of the, about a little, about a third of the total forest land into permanent long-term supplies of trees. And then in the, in the 80s, that sort of stopped. So we're halfway through the process. So we don't have as much second growth forest as as the intention was to eventually deliver. And then uh, about two thirds of the forest was essentially in, intended to just be left. That didn't happen. Um, so we, we, we changed our, what we as a society felt was important uh, on, in regards to forests, whether it's old growth or whether it's large second growth. But until you have second growth, you can't really harvest it. And, you, and until you harvest old growth or original forest, you can't get second growth. So we're sort of caught in this transition of, of having uh, a, a, an aspiration for a large and a continuous supply of, of wood, but we changed the, the game in the middle. And, and there's nothing wrong with changing the game because the forests do belong to society. But we, we do have to use the forests which are most productive to produce, the, to, to produce that wood 
and that's where in the conflict comes uh, sometimes comes. You can't you don't want to harvest wood from forests that take 300 years to generate. We do have forests like that in British Columbia, and you want to have it well regulated. So we're we're in transition, and there will be more second growth coming in. And second growth Douglas fir, for example, is often a a stronger structural wood than the, the old growth. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, um, Anthony, yeah. I was going to jump in with a question unless you were going to respond there. Nope. Go for it. This, so hi, this is Jeremy Cardona from the province of BC. I just wanted to thank you again for the excellent presentation. You and I chatted yesterday and this added on to what I learned in our conversation yesterday. So I really appreciate it. One of the things I learned today is that the ISO standards behind EPDs and behind LCA is potentially a barrier to having more dynamic biogenic carbon modeling. And I didn't know that. And so I was hoping you can maybe elaborate a bit upon that. What, how, how difficult would it be to change those ISO standards? How big of a barrier is that? Uh, I don't know that I can, <laughs> let me just see if there's other experts on the line that can answer that question. Um, I, I'm not sure like what would go into that Actually, I'll just leave it to the floor. Is there anybody that could answer that question? I mean, I just put it putting it differently. Why are these assumptions, these static assumptions baked into these models when in fact, bio, we've, we've always known that, that biogenic carbon is dynamic? Well, I think first off, LCA is like applies to many different materials and many different product systems, right? So it wasn't designed originally to like figure out how to model biogenic carbon most accurately, right? So um, we're what we're trying to typically answer is um, assigning the portion of impact associated with any given, you know, production of a product or, or end service, right? So um, in, in that framework, like it serves its purpose really well and that's how the, the standards were built around. But I, I mean, I don't think it was explicitly developed around how do we address biogenic carbon and all the complexities of it. Because if you think about most other product systems, right? Like whether it's like concrete or steel or whatever, like this is like more like man-made processes. And there are still definitely um, ecological impacts in like creating land mines and whatnot. But in, in forests, the do nothing scenario is very complex because like the forest is a growing living ecosystem. And so there's a lot of complexities around how you would address that. So I met, um, yeah, that, that's my understanding. So I don't know how, and, and so then in terms of like how easy it would be to change those standards, I mean, I would imagine it's probably quite challenging. <laughs> Um, and there's a lot of other factors at play, but uh, maybe other people have input on maybe that. Maybe there's more responsibility with the product category rules than the ISO standards. Yeah, uh, it could be potentially. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. That's I'm not as deep on like the ISO standards and the PCR or the product category rules and whatnot. So I mean, maybe other people can comment on that front, but I think that's uh, that's my understanding at least. Yeah, the PCR is kind of controversial. The SCS PCR isn't so widely used and looks to be a lot more verifiable. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar on that front, but yeah, thanks for sharing that. Hi, Anthony. Um, I was wondering if I could jump in with another question. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm calling in from CLF Seattle oh, cool. and uh, asking about the architect's perspective on this. So a very typical use case for LCA that I'm coming across right now is comparing structure options early in the design. Yeah. When we look at say the typical like concrete steel, mass timber, where's the benefit? How do you see um, GWP bio being applied to this particular use case or any design process? Do you think that yeah. we could use this information to have a better design? I mean, I'm not sure where I said, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think for most people doing LCAs, you should stick with where, where their tools are at right now. And I think like what the numbers that they pump out, like I think it's it's good to understand, you know, the differences and assumptions underlying in, in those tools and whether you're accounting for biogenic carbon and not like some of those things that I presented about earlier. But that said, I think like that is that is the best approach. And um, it's on the conservative end of the spectrum. Yeah, we typically don't account for biogenic carbon. So um, like if you don't account for it, like you just look at A to C results and you don't account for biogenic carbon, that's kind of uh, on the very conservative end of the spectrum. Um, I don't really have a good answer. Like uh, you can definitely, I think it's it's worthwhile to then also report it separately as like including biogenic carbon as kind of additional information. Um, but I would, I was, yeah, so I, I think I would use the default options within the tools, specify what tool you're using and also like whether it's a, um, 
I would actually just state both sets of results and be very clear about that. Because I think oftentimes those results are reported without being clear as to whether or not it accounts for biogenic carbon. So, I mean, I think that's the best I can get to right now. Relating, when it comes to GWP bio, I think that's like really kind of the state of the art research right now. So it may be more of a research field for, you know, academics to look at and maybe for kind of informing policy and that sort of stuff. But I think where LCA tools are at right now, I think that's, it's appropriate for, you know, architects to kind of use them as is. I can, I can jump in on that too. It's yeah. just one of the things that prompted the study was we're looking at um, what kind of credits might be able to be, be reasonable for say reused material to try and help stimulate that market of reused material. Um, so all to say that, that was one of the questions that prompted the study in the beginning. And um, we had this idea that maybe in certain cases, if well supported, there are, there are things that we could, from a policy perspective, actually apply credits to beyond what the tools are doing. So for example, one area I might be uh, from a policy perspective, be open to doing that would be, you know, applying say the GWP bio for reused wood. And that's not, you know, that probably won't show up in huge volumes or something like that, but it, it could help that material reuse industry or that's just one example of an, of an idea. Obviously we want to talk everything through with experts before we do anything, but that's one example that I thought of or had in mind. Awesome, thanks Patrick. Yeah, for uh, forest rotation periods and the GWP bio, I'm wondering why longer rotation periods make the wood more like fossil fuels with a higher number and short rotation periods make it more negative, better for LCA. Is that saying uh, that little trees are supposed to sequester more carbon than mature forests? kind of how I might take that? Um, no, I mean, it's more just that, uh, how do I say it, the sequester, so when you when you cut down trees in the early years, it doesn't sequester as much. And then it gets to a growth phase where it does sequester a lot more. And, 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 so, and then it tapers off potentially at later stages when it's more mature. So I think it's just accounting for that time dynamic versus if you have something that's more of like an annual, something that's growing on an annual basis, that's not trees, like that's continuously, uh, theoretically yep. cutting down carbon uh, every year. And so um, that's my understanding is that like, that's, the, yeah, that's part of the benefit of the rotation period, uh, of the shorter rotation periods. Kind of like treating forests like hemp plantations. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's the implication there. It's a good question. Like, I'm, um, I don't know that the point of this is to necessarily like say like, let's incentivize um, cutting, uh, cutting down trees at an earlier stage. So, I mean, this was actually a question that I had a bit as well as I was diving deeper into it. And I'm not sure that I even fully understand the, the, the methodology behind GWP bio. So I think that's something that I would wanna dig into a bit further uh, on that front. But that's something Jason Grant came up with? Uh, no. WWW? No, well, the GWP bio, or I'm, I'm not sure what involvement he has, but the, at least the original methodology, I think that kind of came from Jeffrey Guess and, and Francesco Chirpi back then, it, more in a research setting in Norway, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? And I'm, I know, oh, sorry, I, I know we've hit time right now, but I'm definitely, I'll stick along as long as, uh, around as long as uh, people want to stick around. So um, keep it coming with questions. Um, sorry, I didn't get to the chat questions. I can dive into that if there's no other. But I would actually kind of prefer people could just speak up on their questions, even if you kind of typed it out. Anyone else? Okay, maybe I'll just take a quick look through the chat. Um, I guess some of these are kind of comments, so it's hard to differentiate which ones are questions. Uh, Anthony, I've got a question. If you yeah. go ahead haven't seen any in the chat um within modeling is there with within athena tally and one click um i know there's limited ability to you know modify the embodied emissions of different timber sources um have you noticed if it's like a substantial amount captured within there or if, if it's really based on the EPD that you're using. Sorry, what do you mean by a substantial amount captured in there? Um, so a, a substantial amount um, using, you know, 
CSA wood versus FSC wood, comparing that to a wood building versus a concrete building? Is it substantial? So first off, I don't think it differentiates between different uh, certification standards. Um, I think they're mostly just using industry average kind of uh, uh, data uh, on right. wood products. Um, yeah, sorry. And then you said comparing between that and concrete. No, no, that that was more that was more my question. I think I was okay. More so thinking out loud. Yeah, so I think it's mostly just like kind of standard industry average data uh, for that. So, so Jeremy, Jeremy, are you asking whether a building built with FSC wood is better or worse than a concrete building uh, when it comes to uh, uh, comparing it? Or oh, sorry, a building built with an uncertified wood has a higher or lower impact than the same building built out of concrete. Is that what you're sort of asking? That's that's close. The the question is more so if we're able to capture the difference between a building built with CSA wood versus FSC wood. Well, and I, I think the answer is no yet. So yeah, far. and part of that is going to be um, you, you've got you've got FSC standards from around the world. You've got PEFC standards from around the world. All those standards are relative to the legislation in that particular country. And I think Anthony uh, pointed out earlier on that Canada has a, a more certified wood than the rest of the well, the next eight countries combined. Doesn't mean it's perfect because we have humans that, that run it and, and we screw up um, and we will continue to do so. But um, FSC wood from Canada is going to be different from FSC wood in the South in the United States or in Russia. So uh, and and there are there uh, even within FSC and the certification systems there are different standards applied in different countries. So you may have, uh, Anthony pointed out some of the CSA, SFI and FSC standards in, in BC, some of them are overlapping. Uh, they may have a different impact than a forest that is FSC or SFI certified in Massachusetts, for example. So it's not the certification system, it's the, it's the nature of the forest that is more important. Uh, and the fact that it's certified gives you a leg up and gives you some level of, of confidence that, that it is um, less, um, impacting than uncertified land right but and 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 right and, and that makes sense um and then is it also true then using the tools that exist today we can't capture we we can't capture that difference within the models yet anthony uh Sorry, I was just reading a bunch of questions. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, just went down <laughs> I was like trying to like basically <laughs> one click tally and Athena. None of them really let us get into that level of detail. Around like, say if we're working with standards? a developer and we can't like if we specify FSC wood no. versus CSA wood, we can't capture it. Okay, that's that's the main question. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Hi, Anthony. Uh, Will Nash here. Um, just wondering, with the foregone, uh, the foregone emissions, yeah. the foregone sequestration, can you change the date that the the tree was harvested? So can you can you adjust? Oh, that's a good point. Um, those assumptions. I don't, I don't recall. It, they may they may have a setting for that. I don't recall whether or not they have that. Um, you'd have to dig into the documentation a bit further on that. Um, I, I don't recall seeing it, but th there may be because it, like there's a detailed tab that has all the underlying assumptions which you can modify. So I, I haven't gone through all of that. So there, there may be potentially um, a place that you can adjust it, but I'm not sure. Cool. Yep. Um, anyone else? So does the uh, does the are you only taking into account the wood and the trees? Uh, I guess you take into account some of the branches, um, could have some issues with assuming that all the slash instantly is converted to methane, but that wasn't what I was trying to get at. But uh, ecosystem carbon and all the leaves on the trees and all the other plants make substantial contributions to carbon sequestration and i'm getting the sense that everything else in the forest is ignored for its carbon sequestration except for the woody materials of the trees uh no so it, that, that's one of the benefits of this tool is that it does actually account for those different uh, pools of um uh 
forest carbon. So like the above ground biomass, below ground biomass, dead organic material, sort of soil or organic uh, content. Um, so it does account for that. Now, I think they have, like, as I mentioned earlier, like that, that may be a limitation, like they have kind of uh, maybe uh, simplified assumptions on that. We probably have better data on that front on, on our BC forest. And so potentially we could integrate better data into that to get more granular, but yes, it, it does actually account for those different carbon pools. I'm glad it's not totally ignored. Thanks. Yep. All right. Anyone else? Anthony, I think it might be useful. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service has done some, some work on total carbon in the forest. It's soil, it's uh, above ground debris, it's decaying and decayed and, and live and uh, standing. Um, and th their approach is a little different. They're looking at the total carbon in the forest. Mm. And that does fluctuate, as you pointed out, with forest fires and stuff. And so it'll be interesting to see whether the severe forest fires in Oregon and California this past year and, and in Washington uh, change the total carbon balance in the forest because th that total carbon balance also includes carbon that is removed for uh, human purposes and includes biomass. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's just a different approach to say, let's look at everything. And it's Scott, it addresses your concerns over that which is uh, re retained in the forest, even though it's not in, in, a, in a trunk of a tree. Mm. And it, it's a different approach and there, you know, for how much carbon is stored in the forest and for how long. And uh, that may be something that I don't know if it's done in Canada or not. Perhaps some of the people from NR can have that, but Werner Kurtz might, might know because that's just a different way of looking at it. Um, uh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, we can look into that. Um, all right. Any, any final questions before we wrap it up? Sorry, I, it's, a, it's a very long chat history. I'm not sure that I can... <laughs> find uh, all the questions in here and some people may have already left the call since then so um i i but if you have any questions please just kind of unmute yourself and, and ask it otherwise we'll wrap up the call now yeah i have one but i just asked one Does somebody else want to ask one first sure. yeah i'm thinking about ecosystem services especially yeah. water the ability of forests to sponge and filter water. They're essential to water supplies. I live in Colorado where it's semi-arid uh, and water's just about bigger than about anything out here. Hmm. It's a huge issue. Uh, so LCAs are designed to account uh, to some degree for how they impact water. It's more like- No, they uh, don't. Well, actually, sorry, in use. North America, we don't, uh, our, our LCAs in North America don't account for water consumption. I think in Europe, because they have a different LCA standard, they use, um, like we use Tracy versus they use something called CML. And within that, they have like something like 18 environmental impact categories, whereas we mainly look at six. And so in Europe, I, th I think they, they do include water consumption, but uh, for our LCs in North America, just given our standards, we, we don't actually uh, address water consumption. And, it's, and it is one of the limitations. So as I mentioned earlier, LC is a limited lens. It doesn't try to solve all the environmental problems. It doesn't address all the environmental problems. There are other things that need to be considered, water, biodiversity, et cetera. So, but yeah, just so you, <clears throat> yeah, just so it's clear, it's, it's, it's not addressed in an LC. Okay, any final thoughts, questions? Amazing, okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and yeah, the, the video will be posted on YouTube and uh, the slides will be uh, sent out as well. So uh, thank you very much.